see you. I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. This week, President Sarkozy of France said that women who cloak themselves with a burqa are prisoners behind netting. And he set up a commission to look at outlawing it in France. Well, our first big question, should Britain ban the burqa? This woman says wearing hers makes her feel more free and independent. This Muslim scholar says the burqa has no place in modern Islam. Well, yesterday was uh, Britain's first Armed Forces Day with celebrations across the country for people to show their support for the military. So our next big question, are our armed forces a cause for celebration? This Quaker says it's wrong to celebrate causing bloodshed. This former Sergeant Major says we need to stop treating soldiers like third-class citizens in this country. And uh, the Pope has declared it's the year of the priest. But, you know, here in Britain there have been decades of so few young men taking holy orders that parish priests have become an endangered species. Is there a simple solution? Should Catholic priests be allowed to marry? Well, we're back at the Manor Church of England School here in York. Delighted to be here with a lively local audience and prepared to think the unthinkable. We have got for you this morning the Mail on Sunday columnist Peter Hitchens, former Taliban hostage and Muslim convert Yvonne Ridley, the writer and critic Badisha, and a member of that increasingly rare species, Father Stephen Morn. <laughs> well, Um Hamza here is wearing a burqa, as you can see, as she does every day. Is it, as President Sarkozy says, a sign of subservience? and subjugation, or does it free the wearer from the tyranny of fashion and how she looks? Now, it's not just in France that the burqa has caused controversy. When the Justice Secretary, Jack Straw, asked his constituents to remove their veils when talking to him, he outraged some, but was applauded by many. Should Britain ban the burqa? Well, Um Hamza, why do you cover your face like that? Um, I cover my face out of my own choice. I choose to cover it, and um, partly because I'm a Muslim, and being a Muslim, um, our Creator in the Quran does say to cover yourselves in a modest way. And I feel, uh, I believe, covering your face is past, uh, part of um, dressing modestly to avoid attraction when you go out. So, the, the danger is I might be attracted to you. Absolutely, because... absolutely. The reason I wear there are so many scholars who do feel that the hands and the, uh, the face do not need to be um, covered. Um, but there are also scholars who say, that, yes, that it should be covered. And I feel it should be covered because the most attractive part of anybody is the face. So is there a danger that, that males in the audience are attracted to every female in this studio's face who's here? Are they putting themselves in some kind of a... Not necessarily every female face, but, yeah, uh, it could stir some sort Passions. of... Passions? Yes. Why, why would it not stir passions in a woman to see a man's face? Well, it's about the burqa, isn't it, and about the woman wearing well, a veil. Yeah. And it's about why women are wearing a veil. Yes, but I'm interested, if, if it's about equality and you, you, you feel a sense of liberation, don't you, why should not men not be required to cover their faces too? Um, it's a good point, but it's, I wouldn't question that. If, mm. if this is how I understand that the scholars have said, then I would do it. And it's God's will. It's God's will. And if you, if you, out of your free will, choose to be a Muslim, then uh, that's part and parcel of it. And you're closer to the Prophet, you feel? Absolutely. You emulate the Prophet's life. Yeah. Touch Hage, God's will. Emulating the Prophet's life. And also a sense of liberation. You know, she doesn't feel a you know, a slave to the fickleness of fashion and being judged. I'm an imam in Oxford and in my Friday sermon I gave three compelling reasons why we shouldn't allow the burqa and the niqab to become fashionable commodities in British society. Should they be banned? No, I think we, the British way is not to ban something because it becomes counterproductive. But I want to really elaborate on the three reasons and I want the audience to consider these three reasons. The first reason is that nowhere in the Quran does the, is the word burqa or niqab being used. No whatsoever. Also, the burqa and the niqab is a pre-Islamic custom coming from Byzantium and Persia and incorporating the Islamic society later. Second argument against the burqa and the niqab, that it is sexist and discriminatory. If it's okay for a Muslim woman to hide her face, then Muslim men should hide their faces as well. 
We are not allowed to hide our face. I can't go into Barclays Bank or the post office or the government office uh, with my balaclava or my motorcycle helmet. So why should we allow in this society when we have gender equal equality, why should we allow Muslim women that right? But, but, but I, I need to develop, what, 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 I develop, it, I need to develop it through the course of the debate because there's some, some potent points there. Um Hamza, please come back on, on, on those points. We'll let, got, then we'll open it up. I've got to stress that it's a freedom of choice. I've chosen to cover my face. I'm not doing it because somebody else has told me to do it or somebody is, or I'm feeling suppressed you into doing it. You mentioned the word scholars. No, you are, like other scholars, they use the hadith. For those of you who don't know, the hadith are the supposed sayings of the Prophet, mostly compiled 250 years after his death. Many, not all, but many are suspect and uh, but, but fraudulent. You, but but this is not subservience or subjugation. This is entirely your choice. Absolutely. And, uh, but, but it is true that the Prophet's wives would cover their faces. And to, to be close to the Prophet's lives and the Prophet's wives' lives. So, if the I Prophet's wives, to be it's, a, it's but, also a level of piety as well. But the Quran itself says that the Prophet's wives are distinctive and different from other women. So you can't claim that bit. The, uh, this issue is really something that you are saying it is religious. I'm quite happy you're for saying, you, you, for okay. you, anyone to have a freedom, but it's, it's based on your cultural interpretation and not the religious requirement of Islam. But, but okay, but um, um, Hamza, do you not see that it might well? Some people find it alienating, and some people find it threatening because the face is such a vital part of our communication, is it not? Agreed, but then we live in a free country, and I think we should be able to dress as we please. Free to mask oneself. Dennis, Dennis McEwen, you, you, we can't well, ban this, can we? This is ridiculous to say. We don't ban things in this country. We don't ban things, but we can make it very difficult for people to do them. There are lots of things we make difficult. Um, Hamza's problem, I think, is that she doesn't seem to have read any Islamic literature. If you read the books, the articles, the fatwa, the fatwas, uh, and listens to many of the sermons I've listened to, all explaining that the reason a woman has to wear these uh, forms of clothing is because the woman is inferior to men, she it will incite lust in men, a woman should remain in her home unless her husband gives her permission to go outside the home. So who is it more offensive to women or men, this then? I think it's offensive actually to an awful lot of people. It's offensive to Jewish, Christian and Hindu women who were chased without I've dressing like this. I've never heard so much rubbish. I don't know what sort of Yvonne Islamic Ridley. literature you're reading, but it, uh, it, it certainly isn't the same Islamic literature I'm reading. I don't think um, Hansa should be criticised for her choice, her piety, but I think this is, more th um, this is above religion. This is about a woman's choice to what she wants to wear. And I think... <laughs> Um, but it's about time men like Sarkozy and Jack Straw stopped going into women's wardrobes. You know, it's it really why, is why, uh, why is it okay for me to show my face but her not to show her face? That That's is discriminatory, her, isn't that it? That is her choice. She chooses to uh, dress like that because it's part of her faith. It's and not part of her faith. This is, it's part of a culture, a tribal tradition, the Wahhabi, the Salafi interpretation of Islam. This is the latest fact. Your well, mother, sorry, your mother never wore a burqa. So why are you wearing one? But, uh, um Hamza? My mother did wear a burqa. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure but about that. Uh, 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 okay, Anna Joy, you want to come in? Uh, yeah. Labour PPC. Yeah, can I just uh, bring a different perspective to this because I think that you're quite wrong, actually. If you look, I want to talk about the evolution of British women in the last 150 years, and I'm afraid, without trying to cause any offence to the young lady in front of me, your dress wear has absolutely nothing to say to me about the evolution of women, modern women, in British society. If you look at the evolution of women's role in British society from the vote through to equal pay, through to maternity leave, you know, those are absolutely key moments. Is it moments. not her choice to it, wear what she wants to wear? It is her choice, but people there is go a through, wider, We but, see people in life, Nikki, Anna Joy, don't we, with Nikki, bits of with, metal through their face. Well, uh, Nikki, you know. but with the greatest respect, with the greatest respect, I think that this is a question about the kind of civil society that we in modern Britain want to live in in the 21st century. Okay. And I think that the burqa does not have a place in a modern British civil society. Um, against that view, it, is, it does show an evolution of British society that maybe 150 years ago people weren't allowed to cover their faces because women weren't equal. 
but now they have the freedom to cover their face if that's what they will. That's rather paradoxical, isn't it? It's a paradox. If it's evolution <laughs> of free will. Yeah. Uh, Father, uh, Jerry. You're not a father, are you? No, I'm not. I'm a, I'm a Methodist. Maybe someone's father, maybe. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I didn't think about that. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> yes, that's a bit worrying for a man in a dark colour. <laughs> what about this? Is, is this? is this a sign, a symptom of subjugation? I want to approach it from a purely pragmatic point of view. If we stop, if we ban the burqa, or whatever it's called, I'm not even sure that's, called, that, that's the right word for Nikab, it. Nikab, burqa, the general yeah. idea. Yeah. If, if we ban that, where do we stop? Do we then go on to ban turbans, crosses, mm. Dog collars. Do we go on to ban everything else? But her, but, 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 is that her, but Disha, her face is being covered. But that is not the point. I think we have to realise that this young woman here is not on trial and should not be subjected to any kind of bullying or interrogatory tone. Because she has, because she has not done anything at all. But I agree, on the other hand, with all the people who say we must not legislate against what people do and don't wear. What do you Having think, a Benisha? debate about women uh, is absolutely the right thing feel? to do. What do you feel? What do you think when you see somebody dressed as Um Hamza is dressed, with their face covered? Do you it think that's a good thing for women? I don't know if it's a good thing for women. I think that Why what not? would be a good thing for women is a lack of bullying towards women, a lack of violence towards women, and a lack of harassment towards women. <laughs> And I think you really need to step back on the bullying tone because this woman is not on trial. The burqa makes me feel well, I think, uncomfortable. Hang on, I think she's, I think she's sticking up for herself pretty well. Oh, I don't no, think there's I any sense of that. I you absolutely know. agree. All credit to you. You're yeah. sticking yourself very well. So, and, and respect to her for coming on the programme because it was quite difficult to That's get somebody exactly to come on saying. and talk about this. Dennis, come back in. All this talk about being a woman's choice is nonsense. Islam is not a religion of choice. <laughs> Islam is a religion of the law, the sharia. It is a religion, it is controlled by the ulama, the clerics. And again, I don't know what books Yvonne Ridley hasn't been reading, but I can assure you that for 40 years I have been reading books in Arabic, books in English, books in Persian, and again and again and again. The law is the woman must cover herself completely, and it is men who are dictating this to women. It's not really her free choice because of the form of Islam she clearly belongs to. Yvonne Ridley. Again, uh, absolute nonsense. Uh, the uh, Holy Quran makes it perfectly clear that women are equal in spirituality, worth and education. And you can snigger as much as you want, but I have read the Quran, I don't know if you have, but it makes it abundantly clear and if you go right into the first development stages of Islam women fought in the same battlefields as the men and the first martyr to, to Islam was a woman the first convert to Islam was a woman but there is a point there, uh, there is, is a point is, is there is there not let's get the, you, you come in here then we'll develop another point go on. it's got to be a choice because if you go to a Muslim country uh, you do see women dressing in burqas but you also see them dressing in Western, Western costumes, yes, yes. shot skirts. But what, Peter Hitchens, what does it say about, uh, about what they think about men, that our passions could be so easily inflamed? Look at all these bare faces that we've got in the studio. <laughs> are we all uncontrollable <laughs> sex beasts or something? Well, I, I was going to ask you, Hamza, if she wouldn't mind. Do you feel, as you look around here, that all the other women here should be dressed as you are? It's personal choice. It I is their choice now. But in the kind of society you would presumably prefer, it might not be so much I think choice. it would be a safer society. You and think maybe, it would be a safer society yes, if they all wore uh, what you absolutely. wore? Absolutely. But isn't this the problem with Islam, that it is, in fact, when it's, when it's a minority religion, it's all very, uh, all, all very liberal and open and, and, and a matter of choice. But if it becomes the majority religion and controls the society, then the choice goes, and people are told what to do, and it isn't mm -hmm. your choice. No, 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 I don't, I don't agree with that, because... Uh, uh, like the gentleman across there says, it's not by force. You can choose to be a Muslim. If you've chosen to be a Muslim, then obviously everything inside in, within Islam is what you're going to be, um, uh, you know, confessing to do. But what you and people like you don't answer, and I really want to answer, if the Quran is a transcendent, immutable, divine text, why didn't God put in the word niqab or burqa? And, for example, the issue is really, you know, this is not something that is required by religion. Religion asks for modesty. It doesn't dictate the, the modesty. What you are wearing is a Saudi Wahhabi ca, 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 thing, uh, uh, a tribal uh, uh, dress. Um, um, Hamza, why, I'm interested in, Peter asked you a very interesting question, but I'm interested in why this would be, in, in your ideal society, why it would be safer if all women, for example, in the studio and as we walk the streets and go about our business, were covered as you are. 
I'm not going to say cover as I am. I'm saying if everybody dressed in a more modest way and didn't um, maybe more looser clothing, etc. I think they'd be. That's, that's what do you think then when you see the way that some young women dress in this in this country with just everything hanging out? What do you I think? think? There's loads of problems in society. It's a very unhealthy society that we live in. Mm. There are so many problems. There are, there are very young pregnancies. There are uh, which you do not find in this. Not so many in the Islamic in the Islamic culture. Patricia, I think it's very very dangerous to look at a society and for one woman to blame other women for the ills of what is done to us as women. If the argument is that wearing something like this repels sexual harassment and all yes. sorts of other kind of harassment, I think that in every situation of harassment, discrimination, sexist behaviour, anything like that, the responsibility is on the perpetrator, mm. not on the victim. It's not good enough for us to say, oh, look at these Western women with everything hanging out. We have every right to do exactly what we like. A woman has a right to walk down the street naked and not be harassed or attacked. Uh, Miriam. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I completely agree, but what I would add is that it's completely irrelevant what Um Hamza thinks of young women down the street or what you or I think about Um Hamza. At the end of the day, what feminist battles were fought in this country, what the feminist achievements were, were the right to wim for women to, to self-determination, to make decisions for ourselves, be it about contraception, be it about marriage, be it about how we dress, isn't be it she about saying whether though, we mould our isn't, bodies isn't, to the conceptions Isn't she saying, I don't want to be part of your society? By of course covering not. Her this face is a question up. you have to ask her, and that's a question she's responded to you by saying no. She's saying to you, "This is a choice I find empowering." And feminism about, is about supporting women who found empowerment, whatever route they find their empowerment through. Claire, I mean, it's ironic in a way that we can only have this conversation about the woman's right to choose in the West, where we have the kind of guarantee of equal rights for women before the law, and in other countries, women are forced to wear the burqa. It's not a matter of free choice, yeah. and so. Yes, because, yes, because in a way we need the language of the West, we need the language, which is a language coming out of a, a, a non-Islamic kind of tradition, to make the case yes, that women are free yeah, to wear the burqa. a European Muslim culture, and we're discussing it from within a European Muslim culture, and it's absolutely outrageous. So are you saying that within, the West within, Islam, within Islamic culture, the language is a completely a free like choice? The fact of the matter is, there is a European Muslim culture in which there is, of course, influence from the language and the debates which have uh, enriched Muslim culture in this, in this am, country. Am I, wait, wait, wait. am I in danger of having my passions inflamed by seeing your face? Personally, obviously, and again, I say I think my opinion on this is completely irrelevant. The fact well, I of the don't matter, think it's irrelevant. Well, I think it is because the discussion shouldn't be about what you think or I think. It should be about women's choice to make decisions about their but, own oh, bodies for themselves. Have I got a right Point. to feel insulted that somebody thinks I would be inflamed if I saw their face? Only if, I have if a right you assume that that's what they're thinking, and I think for a lot, uh, mm. quite a large portion of these women, that's not what they're thinking. Yes, sir. Go on. Um, someone earlier mentioned the word piety, and we haven't talked about that at all, and I think. That's quite key because um, in some uh, Christian traditions, like you have nuns who will, you know, wear veils and things. And when they join a religious order, maybe they're told that they have to do that. And yes, they've made a choice to join the religious order. But what they do is an act of piety. They're not saying everyone has to do it. Um, and I think it's very interesting because you mentioned that it's an act of piety. So I don't know, maybe you'd like to elaborate on Could that. I, bit, on that I think it's quite important. Well, well, let me bring it, Father Stephen in. Uh, Nasser, I will yeah. come to you and do Um Hamza again. But the difference is, we can see, an, with a nun, we can see yeah. her face. I was thinking, I took, I mean, I, I teach at a secondary school here in New York, and I took some of the teenagers to one of the convents uh, for mass to see them and, uh, and to talk to them. And one of the great, thing, well, uh, great things was that they, you know, when we were walking home to school, some of the kids were saying, Gosh, Father, we didn't realise they were so happy. Um, you know, they were quite genuinely shocked that somebody could become a nun, give their life to God. But they could see their face. And still be happy, but they could see their face. And my friend here is right. There are pious traditions that are associated with different religions, and it's their choice. It's totally our friend here's choice, and we shouldn't persecute her for that. And this is England. We don't ban things that aren't harmful to other people. <laughs> However... I, w I would just say a pure observation, and I don't mean this judgmentally at all, but what I mean is we've, I've been sitting here for the last three quarters of an hour, and I can see you smile. I can see you're a happy Muslim, and that encourages me. I mean that genuinely, and it's n nothing to take away from you at all, um, but it's just that I can see that, and it's a witness to me that you're happy in your Muslim faith. 
um, just that hopefully I come across as a happy priest and the nuns did to the to the children. It's just that also maybe just add that element of witness Father, to if you're it. happy, we're happy. Can I Peter, go on. Just, yeah. just dwell slightly upon a point here. Okay. Islam in this country is a proselytizing religion. It wants to expand. It would like to be the main religion in this country if it possibly could. When we what see, religion wouldn't? Well, um, Judaism, for instance, wouldn't. Um, and this is already a, a Christian country, so it's a, it's, a, it's a slightly complicated thing to have Islam proselytizing and seeking to expand itself. And you, you go anywhere now and you'll see new mosques on high points in cities. Mm. You'll see open demonstrations of, of, of Muslim piety of this kind everywhere. It has a purpose. The thing is this. I'm all in favor of people being able to wear what they like. And, and I think that if, if, if we're going to have freedom for, for, for Islam to behave in this way, then we should remember we should also make sure that Christians are free to say and think and do what they like as well, which is increasingly becoming a problem. They're not, you know, and there are a lot of assaults on Christianity in the, in the society. But the, 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 the real point here about Islam is this. If, if it seeks to become the majority in the main religion in this country, does it really actually want all women to dress as Um Hamza as, as um Hamza does. I suspect it does. And I think that's the argument we should really be having. Not about her right to do as she wishes, which I wouldn't want to interfere with, but with what Islam actually wants Can in I this society. Can I just challenge Peter a second? Please do. I mean, I would like to know how many people in here have been pressurized or um, approached by a Muslim to convert to Islam. I would really like to, if anybody it doesn't, take that, for, it doesn't take that form, Yvonne. It's a, the, for, the form it takes is that you, you send your child to a Christian school and he, he comes home and he says he's been asked to design a mosque. And this, this happens a no, lot. No, so you want to come in Islam here. Is very strong. Because you met, you met Diane a few, a few years ago and, um, and now, of course, you, you follow the dress codes of what you believe. Is this not about a husband saying to his wife, I don't trust you, cover up when you go not out? Not at all, not at all. No? It's, a matter, it's a matter, not the choice. I mean, I, I, I do appreciate this gentleman he's talking about. He has 40 years of reading of the Quran and, and the, Tans, and the yeah. books, but I think you should no, go another 40 years to read a little bit more because you know nothing. I'm sorry, this is, this is absolutely a religious issue. Omo Hamza, she has a religious duty and religious obligation. So we must Quran? respect that. I challenge you so on this one. So where is it in the Quran that you must cover your face? I can read it to you out, yeah, outside. I'm sure you but, can. Yeah, but I can. All right? I'm a chaplain and I can't well, why isn't your that. wife's face covered then? Yes. What, that's that's where, the, where they come to the matter of the choice. It's, uh, first of all, it's a religious obligation. Secondly, it's, it's, obligation her, duty. Choice. it's her yeah. duty to do that. <laughs> Thirdly, do you know, do you, are you aware mm. that I'm a male myself? If I go to sure? houses... <laughs> wow. Or I'm, I'm, <laughs> if I go to houses, I'm not allowed to look. I'm not allowed to look to see who is there. I'm not allowed to raise even my eyes. I go there, modesty, just walk in and just meet the male. I'm not allowed to look. This is this is the last, the first the first look for and the Is that a good thing or a bad it's, thing? It is it is a bad thing to look to uh, even and even to, just to identify people. But I'm not allowed to look. Mm -hmm. This what woman here, he should, he should not. I mean, the, 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 should okay, not be demonised. Right, so we, 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 we need to cut to the chase. This issue of niqab and burqa is a foreign importation. When I arrived in this country 30 years from South Africa, there was no such thing. We have have a Wahhabi Salafi ideology is coming in here and we need to examine and ask ourselves as Muslims is this what we want no, because Wahhabism and Salafism is not what Islam well, is about. Somebody has, this you've is had your hand up for so long I yeah, want to hear I what you want to say. And like the headscarf and the burqa in particular is such a personal issue to me. Firstly I have to say that I feel as much as I express myself through colour and you know through western clothing um, that's as much as valid as uh, Um Haza expressing herself through the burqa which is also you know you could say a piece of cultural clothing from the east. Secondly, I personally don't wear the headscarf because I feel that men are going to be attracted to me as I walk down the street. Um, I don't find that uh, a personally important, um, you know, ethos behind mm -hmm. covering. I feel I cover just for myself, literally, just to just to preserve the beauty for myself and and hide a little bit of me from the world so that the world doesn't know all of me. Okay, you know so I mean? Omar, we'll give you the last word. Uh, do, you, do, do people look at you as you walk about the streets of this country? Uh, what you think you live in London? Do people look at you in a strange way when they see you? Do you are you aware of that? I, to be very honest, I've never feel victimised in any way whatsoever. Living in the country, I, I feel very proud for, to live in Britain. Being a free country, it's very, very accommodating so far. And you feel empowered? Very much. I mean, I, mm. I, I feel I've never felt any sense of insecurity leaving my house, going out. I do everything. I'm, you know, I'm a normal mother like everybody else. <laughs> 
and I've never felt victimised in any way whatsoever, and I've never been um, abused, hurled at, or anything like that. Well, I hope you didn't. I hope you didn't feel bullied this morning. Thank you for. Thank you very much, Um Hamza, for coming on and talking. Thank you all very much for taking part. I wonder what you think about this. Such an interesting issue. Let, let us know, please, by logging on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions and then follow the links to our message board. We're also debating live this morning from the Manor Church of England School in York. Are our armed forces a cause for celebration? And should Catholic priests be allowed to marry? So send us your thoughts on those topics too, or any general comments you want to make, please, about the programme. Well, the flags flew, bells pealed, bands marched down many a high street yesterday, all to honour Britain's sailors, soldiers and airmen and women on the very first Armed Forces Day. Now, unlike Remembrance Sunday, it was devised as an opportunity to thank the military for their public service in, uh, in a joyful way. But we don't have celebrations for health service workers or the police or fire brigades. Are our armed forces a cause for celebration? Well, um, where are you? There you are. Mick? Former Sergeant Major, yeah, and uh, Brenda, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Mick's mother-in-law, yes. and also you organised the Armed Forces Day, was it in Leeds? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. in Leeds. You, you, are you, two of you just back from America, yeah? This year we've been to America Different this year. attitude there, Mick, isn't it? Uh, totally different attitude. Uh, you see men and women walking around in uniforms, and the civilians stop and actually clap and pay homage to them. We went to watch uh, Shamu, the killer whale, and the beginning of the show is the guy standing out like yourself, pays tribute to all the armed forces around the world for what they are doing. We're not just there for to... For freedom. For freedom and mm. for the help that they give to the communities that they go into. Mm. Yeah, I mean, is it, that, 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 that's a different feeling. You want more of that feeling here, do you, It Brenda? is a different feeling. And as a mum of offi officers that have served in the armed forces and are still serving in the armed forces, uh, I've seen the huge commitment from the families as well and from the people who are serving in the armed forces. Um, and that's why I believe that we should have an Armed Forces Day to celebrate and, and to let them know that we're thinking about them. Yeah. Um, it is an opportunity as well to give them uh, information about what welfare is available. I think when they come back, the pressure's on for them to get into civilian life and provide for the families and get to work. And they have to forget that 24 years and just get on with the future. And I applaud that. You, but I, I, I do I, think yeah. that sometimes they can have traumatic flashbacks. Yeah, yeah it's terrible. I mean, but, and you put your lives on the line. And it's not just about fighting wars. It's about providing infrastructure, is infrastructure, it? Infrastructure. Don't, you don't go there just to kill people. You go in to, to help the local communities. You give them things that they haven't got. It's, we're there to help no, as I'm, well as to to fight our cause. David, a minute, Miriam, you're making a cynical face. I, I just see out the corner of my eye No, here. no, it was the terminology that I found a little <laughs> just to kill people. But no, I, I absolutely think that uh, we mm. should celebrate anyone that dedicates uh, time and energy to the nation, and that includes possibly the police force and firemen and, uh, and doctors and nurses. But I think that the real service that we do to the servicemen of this country would be to have an open inquiry into the Iraq war and why so many young men and women are dying in the legal wars abroad. That would be a Real service done to our young servicemen and women. Yeah, but I suppose by Patrick Hennessy, I mean, you've served uh, in, in these places. I mean, you are the author of, former junior officer, author of the Junior Officers uh, Reading Club. Mm. Uh, p politicians make their decisions, but this is different from that, isn't it? Yeah, I think why this is so important is because it helps put a divide between deeply unpopular, controversial political decisions and the young men and women who carry out uh, the foreign policy of this country overseas, who have no part in those decisions Absolutely. and who are doing a much harder job than people have. Uh, yeah, go on. I take the completely opposite view. I mean, what it does is muddy that distinction. This isn't brought in in a neutral way, in a context-free way. I mean, think about it. It's brought in in a particular time. You know, it's a time when the government is on its very uh, sticky position. It's a time when we've been mired in illegal wars. It's a time when people have been asked to lose their lives for dubious considerations. But what it does is introduce an ideological aspect where we think, oh yes, of course we must support our troops. And I have 
the deepest sympathy for people who are put in this just appalling situation where they have to lose their lives for reasons which are not. But there's good. much to celebrate, isn't there? I mean, Brenda. What, 100,000 lives lost on the basis of lives? Do we of celebrate June that? has been Veterans Day for many, many years, and every city has sort of commemorated that in their own ways. The name was changed at the beginning of the year to recognise past, present, and future, and that was why it was renamed Armed Forces Day. Give us an idea, Patrick, about some of the good things. In Afghanistan, for example, I mean, you've, you've written about this, well, finding yeah, I mean, a destroyed I th school. I, I think this is, uh, people who uh, are against wars have a kind of great starting point, but I think the crucial thing to say is people don't join the army to go and kill other people. I, I joined the army because I grew up in the 90s seeing things like what's happening in the Balkans on the television, what's happening in Rwanda, and recognising that actually having a strong armed forces is one of the ways we can prevent terrible things like that happening. I would drive into schools in Afghanistan where the teacher had been executed because he was trying to teach girls, and we would clear that school, and you, you would clear that village and you would open a school, and there would be a celebration. I think we are celebrating those small achievements. I agree with the gentleman behind. It shouldn't be allowed to muddy the distinction. There shouldn't be something for politicians to hide behind. But, but that's don't something judge uh, the soldiers. Uh, Yvonne, really, that's something to celebrate. The Taliban of closed the school, destroyed a school, uh, executed a teacher for teaching girls. That's to be celebrated. They came in and they liberated. Yeah, I was in Afghanistan in uh, November and I don't go embedded. Um, I drove in and, and uh, up through from Pakistan and unfortunately uh, in Afghanistan the people don't uh, look at those things. What they look at are the amount of civilians that are killed in airstrikes and the wedding parties that are killed and any of the hearts and minds that um, your people have won have been totally wiped out by the uh, recklessness of the American forces who can't distinguish between ordinary Afghans and the Taliban and unfortunately the people in Afghanistan also can't distinguish between British and American soldiers as far as they're concerned any uniform in their country is an occupying force and the sooner they go the better that isn't my view that is the but people that I've Peter spoken Hitchens, to on the, the ground. the politicians make their decisions but the, these, these people do a good job on the ground don't they? Well whether they do a good job on the ground that's an, an, another question whether we have to have armed forces is the, is, is the important point I, I come from a naval family I respect the armed forces they are probably the only institution in this country which still works and which is still uh, which still actually maintains the standards which have been ripped out of almost everything else we do and we should value them for that reason Sh value? And, and, we, celebrate? we should also value them precisely because they are the opposite of everything that new labor stands for i find it extremely objectionable for a government which has starved the armed forces of resources which sends soldiers into danger in vehicles they're not that that, it's, that that are unsafe which constantly tries to cut them back but simultaneously uses them in unceasing futile ill-planned and, and probably illegal wars, has the nerve to stand up and say, we should celebrate the armed forces. It's not for this government to do it. It seems very Soviet to me to have an armed forces day. Celebrate the armed forces privately and personally, by all means, but not at the behest of Gordon Brown. Dave, what is it to celebrate about the armed forces? I find myself very oddly in agreement with uh, a lot of what Peter Hitchens just said. This is where right and left <laughs> meet, isn't it? Well, <laughs> over the question of war in the, in the present period, I think the person who spoke earlier about context is very, very, uh, makes some very, very valid points. We are in a period where this government has sent young men and women unprepared and unequipped into illegal, into unpopular and into very, very expensive and in the case of Afghanistan, unwinnable war situations. I think that's the starting point. But and when that you hear what Patrick said about the liberation of a school, a school that had been destroyed because women were, and women and teachers killed because women were being educated, is that not a glimpse of hope that there is some good being done here? I think when you look at the real beneficiaries of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, you will find that actually the key infrastructures that are being put in place are not schools, they're pipelines for American oil companies, they're massive construction pro uh, projects for the likes of Halliburton, actually the real beneficiaries are American big business. And there may be, I will not disagree, there may be some Patrick, small successes in small areas, uh, but the majority of it is bloodshed. It comes back to my point that yesterday was National Armed Forces Day, it wasn't kind of National Contractor Day or National Dodgy Political Decision. Day. And I, yeah, I think, Dick uh, Cheney Day. No. I, I mean, I, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is to try and bridge a slight gap in understanding. People see the Army or the Navy or the Air Force in a three minute snapshot on a news show. Um, they don't necessarily see the kind of background of what the Army does, the, the life that the Army lives kind of embarrassed back in the UK. 
And if, if absolutely nothing else, and I, I agree with Peter Hitchens, it, it shouldn't be um, there's something slightly un British about kind of having a falsely celebratory day. It should more be about an understanding day so that people can recognise that the bad news stories that you do inevitably see are not the be all and end all of what an armed forces does. Could we also not sentimentalise the armed forces? Mm. And what my father did, his specific job charged by the Admiralty for 200 years was take, burn, sink and destroy the vessels of the King's enemies. That's what you do. We don't, it's not an international social services squad going around rescuing people from the, the folly of their own governments. We should stay in our own country until people People come and attack us, whereupon we should be able to bash them very hard on the nose and send them away. That's what the armed forces are for. <laughs> Not going elsewhere and telling other people what to Fury do and how to live defense. their lives. Yes. Uh, Barbara, um, f uh, you were f head of the Quaker school near here, weren't you? That's right, yes. yes. I think I know what you're going to say. You may or you may is not. Is there anything to celebrate about our armed forces? Uh, I, I am very much in support of the people who are saying that all sorts of things are getting lumped together here mm -hmm. that don't belong together. Uh, I think that the flipping of Veterans Day into an armed forces celebration is quite a cynical move by the government to try to recover from some of the unpopularity over these wars that are not doing what the government said they would do and are not achieving what was claimed was going to happen. We all saw Bush say after a month in Iraq this war is over. Like heck. Do you think? But do you appreciate what they say? What Mick's saying here, and also Brenda, that wouldn't it be great if their efforts, despite the decisions the politicians rightly or wrongly make, that their efforts were appreciated? A situation where what was it that people getting up and applauding yeah, someone in a uniform? In fact, you're going away. You're actually doing a job, as I saw it, for my country. And I did what I did for, my, for myself and my country. And I come back and I'm treated like a third-class citizen. I, I can't get any types of credit because I've moved around so much from different countries. The fact I had a cash in the account didn't seem to, to come to and anything. you're bottom of the list, you feel? I'm at the bottom of the list. I come out, serve 24 years. Can I get a dentist? Can I see a doctor? Do they ask me? You're asked every single question on these lists. Religions, this, that and the other. And you are never, ever asked if you are an armed forces veteran. Because in five to ten years' time from now, you've got young men and young women that are going to be suffering with well, that, PTSD and they're going to be suffering from those and from blast injuries, internal injuries that you can't see. We're not, we're not coping with any of that at the moment, we're not seeing that, you don't see that, I look like a normal person, well I hope to God I am, but you don't see that on the outside, this is stuff that's happening on the inside and we're not treating about more the soldiers. Respect. Being it's it's with understanding what they're actually going through, giving them a bit of slack when they come back. Barbara. And I don't think having a special day when suddenly everything's treated as if this was what we ought to celebrate is going to make any difference to what you describe. I think what you've described is something that needs dealing with where it's happening in the sort of uh, bad bureaucracy that's prevented you being treated as someone who's doing a worthwhile job. Brenda. And I think there's a big distinction to be made between the excellent peacekeeping work that many of our forces are doing and the idea that armed forces per se are a wonderful thing. Brenda. I just come back from France uh, for the D-Day um, event and to stand at the grave of a 16-year-old who had actually said to one of the comrades that I went with, um, I shouldn't be here, I'm not old enough, and they said, be with us, you know, you, you'll be fine, and he got blown up. But the point that I'm making is, a lot of those veterans are in their 80s. Now, the Dunkirk and Burma in Leeds have had to join with Normandy veterans because their numbers are dwindling. Mm. Now, if we don't capture what they've maintained, and they do some very good jobs of supporting each other, and they have fun together, it's not when they meet, it's all doom and gloom. They know how to have a good time. Accentuate the positive. Yes, yes sir, what would yes. you like to say? Come What's on. wrong with showing appreciation for, for our armed forces that go a thousand miles away, they put their lives on the line every day? Yeah. Yeah. We should appreciate them. <laughs> I think it's an extremely important uh, decision to make a contrast between the people who decide to go to war and the people who carry it out. I cannot think of a more honourable profession than serving your country um, in the armed forces. I'm not to you. But are you serving your country? If there's mass demonstrations like there was over the Iraq war, mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. 
whether people are going for the right reasons, whether the job that was done was the right but job. But that's, but that's, really our, but Patrick, that's our democratic system, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the turnout was in the most recent elections. If people have got a problem with it, don't take it out yeah. on the soldiers who are doing it. Vote the government. <laughs> I think there's another thing that's coming in when you say it's an honourable profession. Absolutely it's an honourable profession because there's something there that we're missing out on and it's called commitment, honour, uh, which are things that we've been talking about earlier on with the other dis uh, discussion um, uh, that seem to be lacking somewhat in society. And the fact that a young man can actually follow orders um, and, you know, and support the democratic system, I think it, it's, it's utterly honourable. Um, also, I think just to, to add to it, would be, I'm a hospital chaplain and I see, for example, um, gosh, I went into the maternity ward this week, was called in, and I saw just take nurses, and this is where I agree with Peter, we're talking about support and finance for things and whatever your political persuasion. I go into a hospital that is underfunded, just like most of them, and yet there are nurses just going the extra mile, staying hours after work to mm. stay with, with sick babies and sick people. Total dedication. Let's, let's celebrate them. Let's celebrate them as well. I'd, I'd be up for it. Absolutely. Just to be more positive about society. Uh, this, Armies. <laughs> yes, I think it's a very interesting issue because there is, of course, that extremely deep question of why it is that thousands of years into human civilization we still live in a global war culture. Because there's a even, even, even nature... deeper point, we still, we still, we're still getting Kim Jong Il's and we're still yes, getting and Saddam's we, and Milosevic's exactly. human and is still not perfectable enough that Perhaps. we can actually work by diplomacy rather than actually actual force. I think that the point that many of the people who have experience of the world uh, of the armed forces have made is really relevant, which is that it's when they're sent away to fight there's all the fanfare because you're doing the right thing when you come back or when you are actually in a war situation you don't have adequate treatment you don't have adequate medicinal care you don't have proper equipment you don't have any kind of support when you're there I imagine the feeling is as though your government which was so supportive of you when you went has basically thrown you away and sacrificed you and this is something that the young men who were lost in the generation of the First World War were writing in letters back home and in their poetry and in their prose. And this is decades ago. And it's really criminal that this should still be going on, that even the most basic provision is not made for young servicemen and women who are out there doing what they promised to do. So they're that's fulfilling that, their half of the bargain. That's, the governments yeah. aren't fulfilling that. And theirs. finally, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Getting the, the, the government to put it, uh, their money where their mouth is. Yeah, we are lacking in equipment in some places, but I don't agree with all you say. Um, it's about raising let's, the profile. It's, yeah, let's raise, the, pro yeah, raise let's, the profile. Let's raise the profile and let people uh, welcome them back. I know we're As going heroes. to have, yes, and we're going to have two freedom parades in Leeds to welcome but them back. Why are we following the, um, the Americans so blindly? I mean, in America they make the military a fetish. Do we wish to make the military a fetish in this country? <laughs> The real problem is not the parades when they come back, but actually the fact that the government treats soldiers like pawns and always have done. The reality is when they come back, one-tenth of the prisoners in our prisons at the moment will be ex-servicemen. The institutions dealing with psychiatric problems are full of ex-soldiers. The reality is, for whatever it says about putting on parades and, and services days and whatever, the government doesn't really care. What it cares about is its greater political ambitions on a world stage, okay. economic exactly considerations. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, um, we have inevitably some agreement for, for David there, some disagreement. What do you think? Log on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions. Follow the link to our message board. Send us your thoughts about our last debate too. Here's one. Should Catholic priests be allowed to marry? And uh, if you'd like to come along to a future show, you can find details of how to do that on our webpage. We are in Croydon next week, Cardiff on the 12th and Bury the week after that. Now, interestingly, our next big question arose because of uh, a problem our excellent production team was having. The hardest people of all to book for our panel are Catholic priests, because they can never find another priest to cover their parish duties on a Sunday morning. So there's a, there's a growing shortage of Catholic priests all around the country, and in Ireland and America as well. More priests are dying every year than are being ordained. Now, as the Pope said last week, without priests... There will be no church. They are vital to its mission. Now, we've come up with the answer, perhaps. A solution the Holy Father, I suspect, might not entirely approve of. Should Catholic priests be allowed to marry? Father John, um, you've, you've entered the priesthood, chaste and, and celibate. 
why is that necessary? Fundamentally, it's not absolutely necessary. It's not a part of the church doctrine. However, it's a, it's a discipline of the church which has been with us for hundreds of years. Personally speaking, I must say that um, I wouldn't be a priest if there was no celibacy. Put, put more positively, what? one of the attractive things about priesthood is the celibate call. Why make life difficult for yourself? It's not a question of making life difficult. I think, with due respect to everybody in, in this audience, I think all of us have difficult lives in, in one form or another, married um, or not. Um, in the end, Christ himself being celibate, um, leads the way, but um, it's even more than that, it's our the, kind of the radical nature of the call, the ca call to the Catholic priest. The rabbis are married, vicars are married, imams are married. But the, yeah, Catholic priests aren't because we, I think we probably understand life a little bit differently from, from Muslims and non-Catholic Christians. Um, I am very, very happy to be celibate, even, even yesterday. I mean, it is a very popular uh, question. Uh, there's no question about it. I was having my hair cut for this program yesterday, and, and there I was with oh, the barber. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, I, I was with the barber, he's called Ali, and, and whenever I go there, he's always asking me, oh, you, why didn't you ever get married? And, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and I always say, look, Ali, this, this is um, the, the, the kind of life I've chosen, and it's something which I think actually witnesses to something much, much greater than anything that we experience um, okay. this side of the grave. How do you, okay, but is it difficult? How do you deal with the feelings yes, it, when you get them? It, it is difficult. Um, I'm made of flesh and blood like all of us. Um, so how do you tempted. deal with that? In any way, which, uh, which I, I suppose all of us should be, you know, through, through discipline, through prayer, through fasting, um, through um, having kind of the really the great faith that actually what the church says is in its kind of countercultural witness um, is is a, is a, um, an attractive sign in itself. Mm. And I'm also thinking of the kingdom of heaven. I actually want to um, kind of witness to um, to the world and to the people whom I whom I meet um, that that there is more to to life and indeed more to relationships. Do you think than such sex. pleasures may come in the hereafter? No, there'll be no marriage in, in, in heaven, so I'm not, I'm not putting it in those terms. I'm not, okay, not right. idolising sex. In Father that Joe, you, you gave it up the priesthood to get yes, married. Yes, I'm no longer Father Joe, so um, I'm Mr Joe. The, the Joe formerly <laughs> known as Father. Yes. Yeah. I, I totally respect John's position there and his preference for celibacy, but the key word is preference, just as in the first debate the key word was free choice. Yes. And I am against compulsory celibacy, yes. and what's more, Remember, the Eastern Orthodox Church has always allowed its priests to marry, and they're part of the larger Christian communion. And in any surveys that have been carried out, for example, recently in France, mm -hmm. practicing Catholics, those who go to church, 75% want the church's teaching about compulsory celibacy to be changed. Yeah, we're, not, we're not into, into, into figures. It's not, it's not a question well, of the thing, your figures, but your figures are dwindling, though, the number of priests, yeah. as we yeah. said. In, yeah. in the end, it's important to uphold the teachings of the church. And at, at, the, at this moment, and, and I can't see any time when, when um, the, the teaching will change on celibacy, nor should it. Jerry, why um, should it change? You're here's, the point, here's the point. You just made that very point. It's a teaching of the church. Mm. The church imposes it. God and Jesus Christ, God laid down and Jesus Christ emphasized the institution of marriage. Yeah, and, and I would celebrate and all marriage. And that entails. Are you, not, are you not being denied a very important aspect of the love which is God? By, be, by becoming celibate. No, absolutely not. I think it's, it's a personal call to God and, and to, to me from God. I don't think the church imposes anything. Um, it, Christ says in the Gospels, you know, some people have got the gift of celibacy, but the vast majority haven't, and that's okay. Yeah, why don't you go on? Let's, yeah. let's get some thoughts from our audience. Yes, in the green. Hi. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, Catholic priests uh, don't have relationships with women, they don't live with women, they don't raise a family. Yet they are there to give advice and guidance and support to their parishioners who have lots of problems in that area. Mm. How can a man with that lack of experience well, be, t then tell a woman with eight children she's okay, got to have a knife? Okay, the heat's off you for a minute. Father, Father, Father Stephen, how can you give people advice on something you know absolutely nothing about? Well, first of all, if somebody, generally speaking, there's a, there's a different nature of John's trying to touch on in the, the nature of the Catholic Church is that most people come to us in a sacramental mode and that they come to us for forgiveness and the sacraments of confession as I've talked about in this program before. Should but the advice, be like thing, Should... the advice thing, yeah, well, your question to me was about I've giving advice question. to people. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a hospital chaplain, I've never stayed in hospital. A friend of mine is a, is a prison chaplain, he's never broken the law. And, you know, if I couldn't give advice to somebody, I wouldn't dream of trying to do it. Um, but to be there for the people that I've been called to serve. And I don't mean to sound overly pious, but John said it's a personal call. Okay, 
we had married priests for a thousand years. We've had married, uh, celibate priests for a thousand years. It could change. It's a church discipline. It's not a church doctrine. So, yeah, okay, if it changes, then I'll go along with but it. But it has changed. There me. are married but priests. Can, but can I put the question that the lady put another way? I, I'm, I'm a member of the Church of England. We have had a married priesthood for hundreds of years. But the Roman Catholic Church is a voluntary society. You can join it if you want to, and you can leave it if you want to. You can become a priest in the church if you want to, and you can not be one if you don't want to. It's their business, it's not ours. If they want to have a, a, a celibate priesthood, it's up to them. Uh, yeah, Claire. Well, I mean, there are many, many Catholics within the church who, do, who, who want this teaching to change, so it's not well, why just they the stop question. being Catholics, then? It's not, it's not a church. Why? Do you it's, think it's, that it's, no it's, tradition it's, can evolve, that we can't have um, a debate within the church about whether or not? I mean, in enough, fact, if you look about the tradition of celibacy, no, no, a lot no, no, of it was material. It was to do with the fact of not wanting priests and bishops to hand on the material goods of the church to their children. And, their, and if you read the kind of, the kind of doctrine, the, 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 the decrees of these councils are very funny, because they say, Priests really must stop having sexual intercourse with their wives. Bishops really m must really start living with their wives. I mean, it was, they had wives. They were just not supposed to be having sex with them. Yeah, and then know, eventually you said, well, we really my, have my, to stop my, having my, wives with their priests. You know? my, I mean, my, it was very funny. My point is you don't have to do it. If you don't agree with it, don't be a Roman Catholic. It's very well, simple. It's the, the point about organizations like the Roman Catholic Church is they stand for certain principles. If you don't like the principles, yeah. don't join the church. Joe. It's, and then, don't don't, don't go into an organization you just disagree well, with. Do you talk about the government like that? Well, the government does this, therefore we won't have any debate because, you know, if you don't like Government's it, it's not a church. Well, yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a debate former, the church. Former Father Joe. We can evolve, as Claire is saying, we can move on. And in fact, uh, the, if you look to any, they don't, want the, they don't want the surveys to be quoted, but in Poland, for example, which is a very conservative Catholic country, 54% of Catholic priests in Poland want that ruling to be changed. We must listen to the people. One of the few rights that lay people in the Catholic Church have is the right to the sacraments. How did your life change when you, well, uh, you know, when I, you I, when you, tried the pleasures of flesh after all these years of, as a priest? Well, yes, I've tried celibacy and I've tried marriage and I would strongly recommend marriage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I, as a person, mm. because I have a wife and two children who are now growing up and all that kind of thing, I have been enriched, not diminished through marriage. Yes. What do you think, Um Hamza, what do you think, looking in at, at, at this debate, what do you think about the, the notion of, of priests not being allowed to marry? Um, with due respect, respect to Father, um, um, I would like to say, though, that a few times I've read in the news where priests have done things with children and oh, it's like, well, if they were allowed to marry, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Uh, well, well, you're, you're suppressing an actual desire. It's, well, and that, you don't that, need to. There we are. To, to associate celibacy with paedophilia is um, an absolute travesty, and it's priests. not part of the argument yeah, at all. But, that, that <laughs> is, but is, your, is it part of the argument? Uh, no, I don't think it's part of the argument. I do think there's an interesting question about what happens when you impose celibacy on people. And I have to, so I have to it's stand kind up. Of part no, of the no, argument. no. But I have to stand up for celibacy here because I absolutely agree with you mm -hmm. that for some people it is a talent and a paragon and a source of judgment and guidance and, and everything that people say it is. Imposed celibacy is completely different from chosen celibacy. And to answer your broader question, yes, of course, I do believe that Catholic priests should marry. And I don't think this kind of rigidity gets us anywhere. I completely celibacy agree with what, is, what is you not imposed. Saying. No, that's exactly, what I'm that's exactly what I'm saying. So you, you can't, can't, be a priest, but you can't go into the priesthood. Well, so therefore you haven't got a vocation to be a priest. That's the bottom line. Well, yeah, but what about priests who've converted from okay, uh, there, there Anglicanism? There are certain situations, for, for example, that yeah, the, the conversion of all Anglican clergymen um, who, who, to, to the Catholic faith who are already married. The, the argument there is that um, they receive the vocation to priesthood um, in another context. Mm. Could I what, what, would you, in what way... F uh, Joe, would you? I keep calling me Father Joe. Once a Catholic, always a Catholic. Once a father, always a father. <laughs> In what way would you have been a better priest had you been allowed to have been married? Well, I think I would have had a, a broader range of experience to draw on. As the lady said there, when you're being asked questions and you're asked to counsel people about marital situations and all that kind of thing. I don't deny the points that the two celibate priests in the audience are making. I just oppose the compulsory nature of it. It's that element of compulsion that 
unless you are celibate, you cannot become a priest. Tom. And it's reducing the number of priests in the world today, and that is a very serious Only issue. 18 were ordained in 2004. Now, you're still thinking of perhaps, Tom, going well, into the priesthood, no, aren't you? Like, like any ordinary Catholic man, I consider priesthood, I also consider marriage. But I have to say, Father Joe would have been a useless priest for me, because if he was married. Because I see celibacy as an affirmation of the beauty of marital love, in that you can only offer a sacrifice as something good. The mm. priest gives up something wonderful, sex and, and love, and he actually... Uh, thereby, not whiskey in my experience of priests. <laughs> well, yeah, it, thereby he esteems the spiritual <laughs> aspect of sex. But Jesus actually only made one comment, I believe, in the Gospel of Matthew, when he talked about eunuchs for the kingdom. But then he added, let those who can take it, take it. He laid it down as an option, not as a compulsory. Well, Je Jesus element. wasn't married, and it was all right for Jesus, wasn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Some and scripture I, I, scholars say that Jesus may well have been married, that that was the norm. It was hardly worthy of mention. And also, there are different traditions of celibacy within the church. I think it's important to make a distinction between celibacy as a monastic vocation, priests who are within monastic orders like the Benedictines or the Trappists or the Friars, the Dominicans, mm. and, and the secular priests, the diocesan priests, who I think often, who often, I think, do then end up leave, living very lonely and arid. Could I just uh, say, Nick, yeah. that's exactly what I was thinking. Oh, Stephen Moore. Sorry to interrupt you, but it was just when you were talking about surveys and asking people why, and only from, you know, being a priest and talking to people, and I suspect that one of the things is, for example, when I'm teaching in the school, I'm talking to the teenagers, which is fantastic, and they say to me, and they probably say to John as well, they say, oh, don't you get lonely? It's like feeling sorry for us, um, that we don't have uh, a wife, and my brother's married, and, and, and very happily so. Um, and it, it, it's like giving something up. And the idea we're talking about the military and maybe honour and, and all that kind of thing is, is going. Also, the concept of committing yourself entirely but, but to you somebody, see, whether do you, it Does be your brother have children, oh, Yes, Stephen. I'm taking... I, they both, yes, they do. do you not I'm think, sure wouldn't be, it be nice if I could have that sort of... Not be part of... It's part of the human condition, sexuality and relationships and marriage. Yeah, indeed, not but it's not... Yes, but it's not, it's not the only one. That's all I'm saying. It's not the only one. And the fact is, like, when an 11-year-old boy... I have boy, quite a few uh, Catholic friends. I, I used to be uh, a Christian a practicing Christian and they uh, they're, they're, they're continually frustrated by the fact that they can't engage with a man over their problems in their marriage as uh, the the lady said there before you know that uh, how can a, a man who has embraced uh, celibacy uh, understand or even begin to understand some of the complex issues that well, are that thrown at um, families. In and this is, isn't what I'm saying, it's what my Catholic friends are telling me. Father John. In my fairly <laughs> limited experience of being, uh, being celibate for four years or so, um, I've never ever come across that problem. I have no. given what I consider to be kind of good, like good, good advice, yeah, whatever, but, but I'm, I'm, so I found... Four years, I four found years of celibacy. Before yeah. that? Before, before that was in the seminary, and before that was at university right, okay. in Manchester. Yeah. Right. Sorry, you were saying something at the burqa there, Peter. I just didn't no, no. I was just saying that if, 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 if Yvonne's friends didn't like the way the Catholic Church uh, treated them, she should persuade them to convert to Islam. But I'm not sure she's in favour of that. But just like the, just like the burqa and niqab is not mentioned in the Quran, the Catholic Church seems to be uh, uh, prohibiting something that the Bible doesn't prohibit. That's not true. It's, it's, it is in the Bible. That's true. So what, what will happen, do you think, in years to come? Well, I go along with the opinion that it will come about. There will be a married Catholic priesthood someday. Not under this Pope, not under this guy, but it will happen someday. Your day will come. Thank you. Thank you for joining. See you next week in Croydon. That's it from the Big Questions. Have a great Sunday.